So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swedish Pavilion and this session that will actually focus on how can Sweden contribute to the green transition also in other countries. My name is Marie Trockstam and I'm Head of Sustainability and Infrastructure at the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. And as you know, one of the main themes for COP27 is actually just transition. And we will focus this session on developing economies and also how we can remove the obstacle, obstacles for Swedish companies and provide climate solutions that could simultaneously contribute to capacity building in developing economies. And by that, I would like to welcome our eminent moderator, Emily Ullander, Climate Action Program Manager at Ericsson. So welcome, Emily. Thank you, Marie. Does everyone hear me? Well, maybe a bit closer. Super. Yeah, as Marie said, I work for Ericsson, um, a telecommunications provider. So we basically provide global connectivity solutions for the whole world. And we know what technology can do to stay, scale climate action. So I'm really happy uh, to be a moderator of this show. Um, and the first panel will talk about solution a bit more in detail. So I will have three panelists coming up. Uh, first we have Alfa Lafvals, uh, Madeleine Gilborn, who is head of clean technologies. Welcome. We have the head of marketing at Heart Aerospace, Claudio Camelier. Welcome. <laughs> and we have the CEO of Minesto, Martin Edlund. Welcome. <laughs> Are you all set? Good. You also have a mic. Welcome, take one. Super. I can you just talk briefly, really shortly, about what are your specific companies doing? Yes, so let me start. So I represent Alfa Laval. We have the sort of innovative technologies that really enable uh, both the green transition. Um, we are not known by so many because our products are typically hidden inside the different processes. But actually, we are uh, affecting billions of people every day. What we do is innovative heat transfer technologies that could be found in any type of process from how we cool and heat our own homes to offices, buildings, but also to everything we're manufacturing from chemicals, foods and water consumption. Thank you so much. Claudio, do you also want to take it there? Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So I'm uh, Claudio from Heart Aerospace. Hart is a startup company based in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, we have approximately 130, 140 employees now and growing. Uh, the Hart was created on the vision that electric air flying can revolutionize regional aviation. So uh, we are developing a, a regional electric airplane, that's the ES-30. It's, a, it's an airplane for 30 passengers, uh, powered by four electric motors, driven by batteries, uh, that it's capable of flying short sectors up to 200 kilometers with zero emissions, uh, with the flexibility to fly longer sectors with a system that we call a reserve hybrid system. But we, even with the reserve hybrid system, the airplane provides significantly lower emissions than conventional aircraft. So it's good for all those football teams, right? They don't want to take the train, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Martin. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. Uh, my name is Martin Edlund. Uh, I'm the CEO of a Swedish company called Minesto. We develop underwater planes. Uh, and actually, the purpose of it is to generate electricity from ocean currents and tidal currents. So we're currently producing electricity at a 100 kilowatt scale. Uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Faroe Islands. Uh, and I think that this is the sort of chain of logic that, uh, that we want to talk about. We need su sustainable, renewable energy, and we need transport, industrial systems that benefit from that and use it. Uh, we're half your size, so we're 70 people. 
based in Sweden, Gothenburg also, uh, but also in the UK. So it's, it's good to be here. Exactly, and good Gothenburg. Good on you. Um, awesome. I think we will deep dive because I feel that this is really encouraging. And I will start with you, Madeleine. And sorry, in Sweden we start with only the first name because that's, that's how we do it. So I will, don't be despaired if I'm continuing doing that. Um, can you tell me a bit more, what is Alpha Raval, uh, Laval thinking about how we can combine business opportunity and supporting the developing countries to speed up the transformation that is needed? Because Sweden, as you know, it's quite small, right? We need to make an impact. Yes, so first of all, I think we have to realize that the industrial companies have a very important play. We are the vehicle of change for this transition to happen. Both because we set the very ambitious climate targets that accelerate the change, but it's also about that we have the solutions for decarbonization. So, to transformation in developing economies, we need to create independent energy systems in the specific countries. So, we have to have green hydrogen, we need to have renewables, and we need to have storage to enable the microgrids. And what we need to do is that we need to deploy, we need to scale and commercialize these technologies so they can be available and affordable for everyone. We really need to make these cost curves to come down so we can implement them. And we in Alfa Laval, we really strongly believe that it's partnerships that will make this acceleration to happen in reality. Uh, and that's why we have a very active role in the CEO-led initiatives such as the Hydrogen Council, the Long Duration Energy Storage Council, because we think that if you're going to make this happen, if you want the cost to come down, we have to sort of work together. We need to work across sectors. We work to work across the complete value chain. And we also have to think about it from a global perspective. And if we do that, I really think we can get these technologies available and affordable for everyone mm -hmm. that we need. How fast can we be? Just uh question back at you. <laughs> we can, I think, absolutely. I think if you look at the battery technologies, how fast we have taken down the cost curves, I think we can do exactly the same for green hydrogen through the electrolyzers. So it's possible, yes. Super, great. And as you said, we need to change the energy sector. Yes. So maybe Martin can go in a bit, talk a bit, a bit more in detail about Minesto and what you can do in the green transition. Yes, I, I think it's, it's obvious for everyone that we really need to, to offer a broad range of solutions to, to address the huge challenge of going net zero with our energy systems. Uh, it, it might be easy for a country like Sweden to, to say that we can get there with our, with our hydro power and, uh, and, and, and good wind conditions and, and a modern grid solution that, that enables that. So even if we're complaining, I think we are at a huge advantage. But most parts of the world, uh, and especially the areas surrounded by, by ocean, Southeast Asia, uh, and, and many other parts of the world, there is, there is a huge opportunity in the ocean currents and tidal currents to offer complementary energy production to solar and wind. And the challenge is not to get you know, 30-40% renewables. We can get that in, in almost any any markets. The sun shines in the day, the wind blows um, often. Uh, but to reach net zero, the cost of that transition is one of the largest challenges that we're facing. So in order to address that, to add planable, uh, predictable, renewable generation of base load characteristics is one part of the solution. And it is what our systems bring to the table. But it's not enough just to be, uh, to be complementary. You need to offer it at an affordable cost level. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges with new technologies. They are not cost effective from day one. So we're in a situation where we need to find other customer values to motivate that extra premium cost for let's say the first gigawatt of installations. Uh, and I think we'll come back to that topic a little bit later, but I think that affordability and complementarity and looking upon the energy system from a higher system level, it's the total cost of providing net zero energy to a society that I, that's our sort of point in this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a follow-up question, even though we will come back to you later, Martin. 
what is the, the potential? Have, have, you, have you looked into the potential worldly as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we view sort of the potential stepwise. So the immediate exploitable potential, uh, maybe 10, 20 gigawatts in some areas of the world, with larger systems, with longer anchoring systems and even surface mounted systems, we will reach a potential that is equivalent to nuclear capacity on Earth. So it's not a niche technology, uh, and for several markets, it's, it's actually one of the backbone technologies to, to provide renewable electricity. That's really amazing, I would say, and what you wouldn't think of, actually, uh, when you think about it. But, so here we are producing the green electricity for the future, and you, Claudio, you want to use it, right? Um, so what do you see your role in the green transition? What is the scalable impact? And, and can you be scaled in developing countries as well? Hello. Is it? OK. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question, right? And we are in the aviation industry. And, and people tend to. Uh, you know, aviation became a, a villain in the industry nowadays. Everybody says, oh, av aviation pollutes and so on. But the issue is not really aviation, right? It's, it's the emissions that airplanes provide. Aviation is a fantastic thing. Aviation is what allowed all of us to be here today. It, 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 it permits a lot of uh, economic growth and development. It allows uh, people to reunite, reunite with, their, with their family members. It allows people from different cultures to learn more about themselves, right, and, and grow together. So it, it, it is really a fantastic thing. And a world without aviation would be a very boring world. So that, that's definitely something that we don't want to, to have. So the, the thing is, uh, how can we uh, reduce the emissions of aviation? And, and there are lots of technologies, uh, promising technologies that are being developed and implemented. Uh, battery technology is one. It's a, it's a technology that is available today. Uh, it's affordable. It, it, it can reach the market before the end of this decade. Uh, very different from other technologies on aviation like hydrogen uh, or, or others that have a much longer time for acceptance. And, and uh, battery technology is not good for the entire scope of aviation. It's more for the short sectors, the regional flights. But regional flights, they account for about one third of aviation emissions. So there is a huge opportunity there on how to uh, grow this segment with low emitting or zero emissions airplanes. And this is really where we see our role. Uh, we, we see opportunities worldwide, particularly in developing countries. Uh, you know, developing countries, people travel less, they, they, but, but they want to travel more. And, and as economic development happens on these regions, they will need to travel more. So the opportunity here is really to allow them to grow their traveling. We are not talking about restricting traveling at all, but grow their traveling on a sustainable way. Uh, and, and this can be achieved by, by adopting electric airplanes for, for their expansion. So you said you had four motors, right? Or and then yes. how, how big is the battery? Like <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, the airplane. It, it's four electric motors. It's an airplane for 30 passengers. For you to have an idea, the weight of the airplane is about 20,000 kilos, and we have like 5,000 kilos out of those 20 of batteries. Okay. So it's very very significant. It's very significant. Indeed, that's amazing. I think we will come back a bit more to that as well. I will, I will go to you again, Martin. Um, we talked a bit about the potential, and I know you, that you have a big potential in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, why is that a cornerstone in the green transition, especially here? There is, there is. Hello. <laughs> The, the, the reason why there is a significant potential is, is pure physics and the layout of, of Earth. The Indian Ocean and the Pacific sort of is 
blocked with all the islands of Indonesia, Philippines and Malaysia. So there are a lot of passages through those islands that collect the flow of the ocean into higher speeds in, in more narrow, reachable passages. Um, and it's also an area where it's very difficult to build large-scale grids. If you have 17,000 islands as Indonesia, um, you, you basically today you have a brown coal power plant on, on each island or, or a diesel genset. 2.7 gigawatts of diesel gensets, for instance. Uh, so, so it's an area where if, if we can create value with renewables and add technologies to that, it will be a really good combination of, of doing business and also supporting uh, industri business evolution and growth and, and job creation in the areas. Uh, I was in this area now for three weeks until I came here, so I really don't know what time it is. Uh, uh, but I think it's, it's rather cold outside here compared to Indonesia because of the, the humidity there. But never mind. Uh, when you travel the countryside there and you see islands where there are limited flat landscapes, everything is rice fields, you want to squeeze in solar there, difficult. Uh, you want to see industrial development and more value added. Uh, so they have a lot of raw materials from mining, for instance, setting up EV battery factories. Uh, but the problem is that Tesla, Poolstar, the, the big EV manufacturers, they will not touch your products if it has such a huge carbon footprint. So if it's lignite, brine coal generated factories or, or fuel factories, you're in trouble. So an interesting drive and opportunity, I think, for us and for others is to collaborate with the industrial actors that are also independent power producers as a parallel growth of renewables because it's a huge business need to reduce the carbon footprint to be a part of the global supply chains. Yeah. So that's, that's an opportunity that... Yeah. And in the collaboration, do you also need finance if we're going to, to look into the next panel suggestion? Is this something that is missing in your point of view? I, I wouldn't say that finance is missing, but it's, it's really a hard job and a full-time job for you know, small technology providers to open the right doors, yeah. to push into the project developers and the really the big thinkers. Yeah. Because the first small-scale projects will not be profitable. Yeah. But if we talk about 10 gigawatts in Indonesia, it's going to be a huge business. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's really a matter of, of your sort of entrepreneurial drive and ability to find complementary values to, to the first business cases. Yeah. Okay, super. Do you see the same problem, Madeleine, in terms of finance? But what can also you as a company really, really bring to the table now um, to really speed up the transition? Yes, our role is that we are a global company and manufacturing company. Uh, so our role in many parts of this is about that our expertise lies in the commercialization, industrialization of innovations, because that's what we have done for 100 years. So if I take like a concrete example, because now we are very energy uh, focused, but I think we also have to take the question of water. So for example, if you want to enable green hydrogen uh, in the developing economies, we need water and renewable electricity to produce hydrogen. So if we were on the 2030 targets having 90 gigawatts of green hydrogen, we need half a million cubic meter of water per day we cannot use scarce portable water if we talk about developing economies. So we have the technologies as a concrete examples that you can allow us to use offshore water or river water and desalinate that to be able to produce hydrogen. And the beauty of this is that we don't even have to use extra energy. We use the, the off waste energy from the electrolyzers to desalinate it directly. And it's these types of innovations and technologies that we need. So we have to think from a system perspective about the energy and the water and make this like microbit, we have to think this as independently because that's how we can make it affordable and, and available also for everyone. And you don't think that, ooh, that you're lacking finances in that sense as well or is it more the collaboration that it's 
missing or you know what is the missing link i, I mean you need finance right mm. because what the, the problem is that these technologies are not affordable today we talked about it before i mean because when you have new innovations they are too costly so you need finance and the right policy support to be able to scale these technologies deploy them and commercialize them and that's the only way to make them affordable for everyone mm. so finance has a very good uh, and important part to play here yes I, I think you are alluding to something very important scale here in, in an innovation process, it's often quite easy to fund a small-scale prototype or, or a demo sale of something. But a lot related to infrastructure, uh, energy sector, is very difficult to prove and demonstrate at small scale. So you need to get sort of investors that are willing to bet significant amounts of money in rather risky investments. And I think this is why it's also so important that we get the really, really big players on board for the small projects. So we, we have for maybe a decade tried to get big offshore oil and gas companies on board for what we're doing. Ten years ago, they wouldn't listen to us. Today, they're calling us to have discussions. And for them, we're talking about you know, pocket, pocket change money for what's a big project for us. And especially with today's oil and gas prices, there's certainly uh, cash available. That's quite thing, yeah. And that's also quite um, interesting in terms of the aviation industry as well, right? You know, that's quite huge investment. And especially if you think about the innovation you are doing today, right? Um, so do you feel, um, Claudio, what is really the barrier uh, for you um, that we can transform the industry with? I will build on the previous answers here because I completely agree yeah. with what was discussed. Uh, when we look at implementation of new technologies, generally they are not plug and play, right? It, 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 has, to, uh, it has to have a lot of enablers uh, for, for you to adopt new means of uh, uh, generating energy or, or new products, uh, low emission products uh, uh, implemented in the market or in our specific case in the air transportation market. So it's uh, at, at the end of the day, it's the whole ecosystem that has to work together. And uh, of course, we hear this a lot. Wow, well, everyone has to work together, right? But it's, it's about investments, right? Investments on uh, uh, companies starting up and developing the technology, uh, investments on uh, allowing companies to bring that technology to the market, right, in the industrialization phase, it's also very important. But it, it, when we look at our specific case, aviation, right, it's, it's not just about an aircraft manufacturer providing a product and, and an airline willing to buy it. This airplane will require some changes on the airport infrastructure, so it needs availability of green electricity, it needs availability of uh, battery chargers on airports. Uh, as, as it was mentioned, initially these new technologies are expensive and uh, uh, many times airlines, they need support in financing those products and how to implement that. So it, there are really a lot of players in the industry that have to work together on the, on the financing of development, of the financing of, uh, of uh, industrialization, financing of sales, and, and not only of the product specifically, but of the entire ecosystem. So we need chargers, we need green electricity availability to make it happen. Thank you so much. When I listen to you, I feel really hopeful. And it also, I think all your companies are a bit different from what we usually hear in some of these panels. And I'm really grateful for that. We have to um, end this awesome panel, but please stay put. We will have our second panel coming in a while talking a bit more on the financing part and what it really we can drive the transition with from an export side. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I hope you feel energized. I feel so hopeful for the future um, and I hope you do too. I will now come back with um, Marit Trugsam, uh, Confederation of Swedish uh, Enterprise. 
and you are the head of department sustainability and infrastructure. Great title. Um, we will also have Jan Larsson, uh, the CEO of Business Sweden. Welcome up to the stage. Um, and Director General Anna Karin Jatko for the Swedish Export Credit Agency. Uh, no, you have to go. And then we have Magnus Montan, the CEO of the Swedish Export Credit Corporation. Great. Do you also get some mics over there? Yes. Super. Do you have everything you need? Great, super. Maybe we should talk a really short introduction round um, because there are some companies, uh, like, if you sound a bit the same. Like. <laughs> So maybe, do you want to start, Magnus? Um. Can you hear me now? Yes, so um, my name is Magnus, and I'm the CEO of the Swedish Export Credit Corporation. Um, the abbreviation is SEK. We are a government-owned bank, and we exist to help Swedish export industry become competitive. We do that by financing exporters, their suppliers, and their buyers and their buyers overseas. We also have a strong mandate from our government, i.e. our owner, to be a leading force when it comes to financing the transition. So we're a bank, we're regulated as a bank, and we're financed by the capital markets. We work out of Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö. And you have a quite close direction to the Swedish Export Credit Agency, right, anna Karin? So can you just also <laughs> maybe put a context into it? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's working. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, for those of you who have always been wondering what is export finance, just let me give you a very, very brief introduction. Export finance, it goes without saying, is there to ensure that the world can afford to buy Swedish companies, goods, services and not least technology. And I think we had two fantastic examples from Minesto and Hart in the previous panel. Uh, export finance means that financing becomes both accessible to the buyers of Swedish goods and services, but also advantageous. And this is the key, because without financing, and I think some of our colleagues just mentioned that in the previous panel, there may be challenges. Um, where does EKN come into this? Obviously, you know there's a bank, and when there's a bank, you normally need an insurer, somebody to assume the risk. We've been doing this for 90 years. We do it in 140 countries annually. And uh, we cover risks for exporters, uh, both from the smallest, most innovative Swedish companies, uh, but also to, of course, the largest Swedish corporates. And we have been working with the largest Swedish corporates for many, many years. Some of the more innovative Swedish companies, we have started working more recently. And I can assure you, it's really, really fantastic to hear about their technology on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you so much, Anna Karin. Um, maybe, Jan, do you want to go? What is Business Sweden? Hopefully everyone knows because we're in your pavilion. But yeah, one, of the, one of the things we do is to organize uh, uh, the pavilion here at COP27. <laughs> but apart from that, uh, we, are, we are also half owned by the state, half owned by Swedish Enterprise. Uh, we do have the responsibility to attract uh, foreign investments into Sweden, but also then to support uh, uh, companies uh, exporting to other, uh, to other uh, uh, countries. The biggest uh, client we have is the Swedish states, and that pays us for, for basically helping small and mid-sized enterprise coming into the world uh, and, and, and exporting their products. But we also have a lot of private fan finance from, from companies that buy our services in order to find markets or production sites in other places of the world. So you can say that we are kind of the, the network for the Swedish enterprise, big and small, to find new markets and find new um, well, places for, for their business to be developed in. 
Okay, great. And then, uh, Marie, so how, how is Confederation of Swedish Enterprise coming into the picture and what do you do differently? Yes, it's a very relevant question, Emily. And the Confederation is representing 49 member organizations with 60,000 companies. Of, actually, the majority are small companies. So our mission is to create the preconditions policy-wise to enable Swedish companies to be competitive, innovative and sustainable. And I think that's great because I think even though Sweden are quite a small country, so what we can do is actually influence other countries to do more because we have been on a really good journey and I think our industrial sector has really done amazing work in the past but I think the innovations we see today is really interesting and so Marie, in terms of the export again, we, let's dive into a bit more on that. Um, what can that have for a global climate impact? What's our, what are the enabling effects of Swedish export? Yeah, thank you, Emily. And I will start off actually referring to what Professor Johan Rockström said yesterday, that we need to have a sustainable long-term economic growth in order to have a just transitions. So we need to remember that. And of course, it is the companies that are driving that from small-scale entrepreneurs, as we've heard here, and unicorns and also large corporations to actually scale up already, um, I mean, the present technology, but also innovate in new ones. So coming down then to Swedish companies, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise has conducted a study together with Material Economics that already today the Swedish export is actually decreasing the global emissions with tw 26 million uh, tons of CO2 and that is presently so if we can accelerate that of course the benefits will be great and just to mention then how how is that possible it's actually based on an almost fossil free energy production in Sweden so we need to continue to have that whenever it's needed and at a, as been stated here at also at a reasonable price together with faster and more predictable permit conditions if we can do that and continue to accelerate that we will, of course, also contribute to also the developing economies in the end. I think that's really interesting. And maybe on the kind, can you, do you have some more specific expa examples of how Swedish companies can contribute to this green transition? Thank you. Of course, I do. Don't get me started. So I'm just going to give you four very brief examples. The first one is that, um, and I'm going to use examples where EKN, the Swedish Export Credit Agency, often together with ESICO, has been financing large projects and scale-ups. Swedish industry has got plenty of green transition technology, and one such example is uh, the world-leading technology we have in electricity transmission. The HVDC link between Saudi and Egypt is a very current example, an important example, uh, which a lot of the um, goods and services are actually produced by Hitachi, Vesteros in Sweden. Uh, we have high voltage company, uh, cables produced by NKT in Karlskrona. They have been part of some of the largest, largest wind farms. Sweden also offers transport with fossil-free fuels. One such example is Abidjan that needed a bus rapid transport system. It's rapidly growing. You need public transport. You need infrastructure. And Scania, the Swedish um, bus and lorry company, have uh, uh, established a complete system of bus, bus rapid transport in Abidjan and these buses can actually run on banana peels. So very green, very forward thinking. My third example, I'm going to be, I'm going to be brief, I yeah. promise, is the new standard of responsible mining that a number of Swedish companies are setting, LKAB, Epirox, Sandvik, ABB, Volvo, Combitech, just to mention a few of those. Um, mining is a very important industry when it comes to climate transition. Sweden has a very long tradition in mining and we have now seen a lot of development. We can now offer a turnkey fossil free digital mining where we can have also have a very advantageous financial offering when it comes to buying these turnkey solutions. And last but not least, my fourth example of course is 5G. It goes without saying that you need 
high-speed telecom in order to be able to really benefit by a lot of these innovative solutions. So that's it. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you, and uh, of course you end with a really good example, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you for that. I will not uh, say anything more about that. But maybe, Magnus, can you just, how do you come in to the picture then? Like, continue a bit more. Like, yeah. how do you support the green transition together with EKM? Absolutely. I will do that. And um, as I mentioned, we are a bank, so we, we are the fi financier. So the short answer is that we do that by providing finance uh, to often then to the buyers of Swedish export. Um, and just to put this into context, so we have a balance sheet at ESICO of about uh, 30 billion US dollars. And we have made a commitment that by 2030, 50% of that balance sheet will be directed towards green assets. It's, a bit, it's about less than 10% today. And that gives you an idea of the scale of things that we really need to focus on financing green projects, whether it's in Sweden or overseas. And as uh, Anna Karin has been talking about, Swedish industry, Swedish innovation technology has so much to offer when it comes to the transition in several different areas, not the least transport and logistics, energy supply, also smart cities, ways to energy and, and, and so on. So uh, we finance then uh, buyers uh, of these uh, Swedish uh, goods and services uh, and innovation. And when we do that together with IK IKEAN uh, that uh, provide a guarantee, not only do we provide the financing, we also set very high standards when it comes to sustainability uh, for these projects. Um, and um, we follow, uh, of course, the UN principles, the OECD standards, and also the IFC performance standards. So we find that often when we're involved in these projects overseas, you know, we contribute to setting a higher sustainability standard uh, than otherwise might have been the case uh, locally. Um, so, and this is a very important point, uh, so it's both the financing but also helping out to set uh, a high standard. And um, it, it was mentioned about the importance of collaboration. When we work together, it's not only EKN and us, it's of course with the Swedish exporter, the buyer overseas, but there is often a commercial bank involved as well to help um, uh, arrange the transaction. And I think this point about collaboration, which is talks about here on, um, in the floor in one of the taglines for the pavilion, collaboration I think is, is really key because that is how we're going to solve uh, the challenge that we stand before when it comes to, uh, to, the, to the transition by exchanging goods, services, ideas and solutions at a higher space internationally. And, and we together we do that by providing finance to buyers of Swedish content overseas. Is it do you have different type of like a bit more beneficial finances if it then considered green or do you have the same for uh, for different types yeah so sure so we have uh, at Essico we have many different types of uh, financing um, when it comes to the Swedish exporters it can be working capital it can be term financing when it comes to the buyers overseas it's typ typically either project finance or export finance um, irrespective of the type of finance, these loans can be branded as green or sustainable. And, when, they, uh, and when, we, when we manage to do that, then typically the pricing is a little bit finer or, or cheaper. And I guess that's what we need, right? So we really get that transition. And we see that also for big corporations, even though it's uh, internal financing as well. Um, but great, amazing work. But then I, I will want to turn to you, Jan. Uh, maybe you can like, you know, sum it up. And, and how is Business Sweden's part of this play? Can we scale more? Our ambition is, our ambition is to kind of be the knot that holds it all together. Uh, by having all those offices in 42 places around the world, we naturally have a very good connection with both policymakers but also companies uh, across the globe and by using the ability to actually finance and, and give credits and also reach out to Swedish companies I think only by actually helping those companies that were up on stage here beforehand getting out to the new market getting out to the markets where there is both uh, a, a already existing demand of their products but also naturally 
tie them together with, for example, foreign aid and other programs in, in the more poor parts of the world. Uh, if we can help doing that just by, just by opening up the markets, we can really both support the transition to a, to a green economy, but also actually help those companies prosper and grow. And that is taking advantage of the position that Sweden has today, because we are really in the world lead of, of uh, uh, climate smart solutions. We've been there for almost 50 years, speaking about the environment sustainability as a positive um, means to, to drive production. And now I think we can basically get the advantages out of that, because the companies in Sweden, although Sweden is a very small country, the companies are super advanced in some of the specific areas. A lot of that has been displayed up on the stage here. Much more will, will, will come. But just to help those companies, those innovative startups and scale-ups and, and established industrial companies uh, get out to the world will actually support the world in, in, in reducing uh, CO2 emissions. Has it been better since before? Like, have you seen an increase in this? Like, you know, are we even more hopeful for the future? Like, can we uh, raise the bar even more? No, I, I think we can raise the bar uh, naturally much, much more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm at the same time very, very hopeful because just looking three, four, five years back, there were really not, the, the innovative level was not even close to where it is today. So there's so many, not only smart thinking about how to solve this, but I mean, uh, Inesto actually has uh, uh, their, their little underwater airplane already swimming around uh, in the middle of Atlantic, proving that they can do it. There are so many things that are actually being manufactured and being, being distributed. So now it's not, the solutions are there in, in a large extent. Now it's more how do we actually make that, those solutions be affordable abroad, as was said here before, be financed abroad, but also be wanted, be demanded uh, from, from, uh, from, other, uh, from other consumers and investors. And also naturally when we look over, for example, Africa, or we look into the poor parts of the world, we need to find ways there as well to make them leapfrog into the new and best technology, not be forced to take the path that we have done. So I think that is another one of the real big, big challenges that we have ahead to kind of well, tie together uh, foreign aid and export economic development and so on. Exactly, and then the affordability comes in, right? Uh, we really need to make sure that the right solution is also the green and the best solution for the climate. Um, and w we talked a lot about green energy today, um, and we know the country will need it, uh, but maybe a few of them also have quite high governmental debts um, and high costs. So, Anna Karin, like you know, from EKN's perspective, how do you see this? Well, I think that's really partly what COP27 is all about. How do we ensure that different sources of finance can be at play here? Because, of course, some of the countries that need to be making these investments already have financial and economic constraints. And I think what we need to be doing then is to ensure that there is finance available, I'm looking at Magnus here as well, um, that ensures that you can actually choose the long-term innovative green solution. It may not initially be the most affordable if you only look at the immediate cost, but with the right financing, you can actually also afford to buy the right technology. And I think a key factor in all this, by 2030, the emerging markets will need to sevenfold their increase in renewable energy. So we need massive sources of finance. We are one source, but I think we also need to be looking at new forms of collaboration my colleagues have already alluded to the fact that you need to combine aid financing, direct finance investment, commercial financing, export financing, and we also need to find new ways of collaborating in order to really pool these resources and ensure that they are used for the right type of innovative solutions. Um, export finance has an annual turnover globally of about 700 billion US dollars. This is a huge, partly untapped potential, and I think Swedish companies, together what, with our offering, can actually really make a difference here, also to countries that may face financial and economic constraints. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Magnus, do you have anything more to add on that, maybe? I think you're so y close collaboration. Yeah, uh, I will try to add uh, something to it. Um, m maybe just by starting with saying, so <coughs> when we are involved in financing uh, projects overseas, we tend to look at Swedish content, and we have a rule of thumb that as long as it's more than 30% of Swedish interest in a project, we can be involved in financing up to 100% of, of the entire project. And when we talk about Swedish interest, then typically we mean goods that are produced either in Sweden or produced in somewhere else by Swedish companies. So, so that's the, the, ru the rule of thumb. Um, the advantage when we finance, uh, you know, within the export uh, credit uh, system is that we work with long tenors, which tends to be a challenge for the commercial banks. Um, uh, today we can go up to 18 years uh, in tenors. We tend to have uh, competitive pricing because we're often guaranteed by EKN, AAA. Um, and um, we also, uh, as I talked about, set these high um, sustainability standards in, for our projects. Um, another aspect when it comes to, to the green financing, uh, as far as SEK is concerned, is that the source of the financing, as I mentioned, we're financed from the capital markets, uh, comes through our green bond uh, framework. So this is then investors at the global scale that invest in SEK, so we can on lend this money uh, targeted to green projects. So all those projects that are done under that umbrella or that part of the framework uh, follows the EU taxonomy. So they classify under the EU taxonomy. Uh, so that's important. Uh, but there is also a challenge in this because the EU taxonomy today only account or economic activities that qualify under the EU taxonomy today only represent somewhere between 3 and 5% uh, of real uh, activity in the economy. So it's very important that actors such as ourselves can also be involved in financing other forms of sustainability linked activities that don't necessarily are 100% green today but that help us take us in a better direction um, and we do that through sustainability linked loans at, at SEK mm -hmm. and then they are typically linked to our customers ambitions and strategic development goals when it comes to reducing CO2 emission or increasing their energy uh, efficiency so uh, uh, green financing is very important, but we also need to have some kind of flexibility to finance activities that are not 100% green today. I think that's quite key for us yeah. to get to the final goal. Exactly, and the standards like, you know, um, taxonomy can also be debated a bit more, like, you know, what is actually is green in that sense as well. And I think that will be evolved uh, as we go forward as well. And I think for me, as a linked uh, finance is a really good way because then the company can push and even you know the banks are also learning more of you know what is actually sustainable for a company and you can be a bit more high look at the hotspot of a company to actually set those targets that are active um, but Madi, I will um, sorry for uh, you have been a bit quiet now I will turn the action to you um, and what actions can we take in order to enable an, an accelerated transition through these Swedish exports that we've talked about today? I will actually, I will actually change mic. <laughs> <laughs> I will reply to that question on a policy level because as you said Magnus on the EU taxonomy, being a Swedish company you might not even ha have the time to think about how I mean you are really affected by the ambitious EU legislation but one example of that that also the confederation is driving now is the lack of possibilities for innovation there is specific industry emission directive if that will be changed as has been suggested it might actually end up in fixed uh, values for the energy um, usage and the emissions and as we know for example in terms of fossil free steel that wouldn't have happened if we had those fixed values so from our side we work on the policy level in a proactive way to really make sure that the policies then will eventually become the Swedish law actually I mean improves and contribute to the innovative climate so that's one major action that from our side are driving 
And then also we want to have like a, a level playing field to have the solutions as much as possible on a global level. And I know that all of us here, but also like for example, the International Chamber of Commerce are driving a global price on CO2. So that's one other policy measure. And the third one that we all been touching upon is of course in Sweden to have a lot closer cooperation with CEDA and the development cooperation in order to build the capacity in terms of sustainable procurement, the mechanisms for a carbon adjustment, and you have a lot of good governance issues, and then combine that, of course, with the solutions that our companies are providing. For example, uh, reading the national determined contributions from developing economies with a lot of focus on energy, as we've been speaking about. So there are also policy changes needed to really enable how, how we could support also developing economies. Exactly, I think that really good points as well. Maybe Jan, you want to, to continue on that note? Like, how can we make technology available for all? Like, what are the missing components today? Maybe add a bit more on what Maria is talking about. Yeah, Maria is much better lobbyist than me. Uh, 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 but when I speak to Swedish companies, I mean, they, they would typically say some of the things here. One, we need a tax, and you very rarely hear Swedish companies speak about that they want a tax or they want a tax increase, but a global tax on CO2 emission would really, really be the big driver and be totally technology kind of uh, neutral in, 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 in the construction. So that would be a huge, huge step forward, I think, to drive this whole thing. Just add a cost on coal and, and, and we will have a lot of done, uh, a lot of things done. I also agree, and, and a lot of companies also feel that, yeah, by putting foreign aid together with export promotion and, and, and also increasing the demand on the projects that we finance uh, via foreign uh, aid on their climate smartness would, would uh, also be very, very beneficial. And then I think thirdly, what I would say to the politicians today is that they have to acknowledge that it's the companies that are in the driver's seat. The companies are the engine of the development right now. They are pushing the innovations. They are finding ways to finance. And very often together with, with, with state organizations, but also by finding private finance for, for doing what they're doing. They're finding the new markets. They're pushing the technology. And they go to work every morning believing that today I want to contribute even more to a climate smart world. Uh, and I think just by acknowledging that, politicians should understand also that their role is very much to put out the long-term road, so to speak, so that companies today know what will they have to deal with five years ahead. Because with that long-term perspective, it is so much easier to run innovation, to get the finance in place, and actually develop those products, uh, uh, because there are too many insecure, there are too many uh, 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 obstacles as it is. For, for politicians to create even more obstacles. So long term, price on coal and, and, and more cooperation, collab, uh, I think that is the, the, the kind of the way forward. Really good points as well. And I think, you know, as we stay positive, positive, we can also drive the change because then our minds are working differently, right? So the final question, are you positive, hopeful? Yeah. Well, I am definitely. Uh, good but, idea. But, that, that's the charm with my job. I need. To, I, I get to meet all these companies that actually are working, getting up uh, and going to work every morning with the full belief that we will contribute to a better world tomorrow. Uh, and by doing that, you kind of end up being hopeful and positive uh, uh, yeah. by definition. Yeah. Final note for you, Marie. I just want to build on that. I received a couple of questions on that matter because there are gloomy times. We, I mean, we could all agree, but being here, listening, as John said, to the companies, you cannot be positive and optimistic because there are concrete solutions. We need to scale up. We can't forget about many technical solutions are already present, as we've heard, but we need to enable scaling them, but also, of course, have the sustainable economic growth to invest in new ones. But so I'm really optimistic. Good. Are you the same? No, uh, absolutely. Very. Um, I mean, I think we, we need to accelerate. We need to do more. So we cannot be con um, uh, we cannot be content. Um, but um, definitely feel positive. Strong believer in uh, the forces of the market. So companies and institutions are beginning to understand that we need to change. It's not only about wanting to change, we also have to change, because otherwise the market won't be there yeah. for us. Uh, one thing I think is important is that policymakers 
also keep up with this, um, like both of you were alluding to. Um, but plenty of reasons to be positive, I think. Super. And then Anna Karin, you will be the final one to be either positive or... <laughs> Well, Swedes can be quite consensual, but I think I'm going to put it very briefly and succinctly. We can't afford not to be positive, and that's why we are. Exactly. We need to change now. And with that, I think I will thank you, say a huge thank you to all of you for coming today. I think we've had two great panels, um, and I'm sure hopeful after this. And um, thank you for having me and all of us, and uh, goodbye.